Okay. Uh, one sec, everybody. We're okay. I'm I'm told you can now hear me. I just want you all to know that. Can you all hear me? Let me know if you can. Oh, you can hear great. Um, you missed. That was my best intro I've ever done. Like I cool. I don't think I'll ever top that. <laughs> um, a person in the next room over, I think, literally died of laughter. I'm sorry you didn't get it, but it was so good. And it's unrepeatable, like all great works of art. Uh, Daniel Roman, what did you think of my undeniably hilarious and never before seen intro? I thought it was definitely the peak of this podcast. We've got nowhere to go but downhill from here. And I'm I'd say I'm sorry to everyone who missed it, but now I just get to keep it all for myself because I heard it and it was majestic. Uh but Dan, how are you doing today? And all of you out there, how are you doing? You ready to talk shop about fantasy stuff? Absolutely. Um at, I'm ready to go downhill from here. So let's start as we often do. <laughs> With a visit to Westeros, because actually, I, I know we always say this, but mm -hmm. House of the Dragon season two, it's filming and we are getting some good stuff, some good behind the scenes picks, some yeah. good canny use of drones, some use of drones that frankly, well, you'll see. I'm wondering how they're not catching, but let's look at some of the set picks coming in uh, from the set of House of the Dragon two, starting with this image of Leaves in Studios given to us by uh oh i should have looked this up i'm sorry uh to uh by a hd box on twitter they're very good whoever they are we salute you because you've been doing wonderful work the lord's work um and we see here what looks like the house dragon set and daniel what do you think that silver white strip of barrier is in the upper part of the screen I mean, there's only one thing it could be, right? And uh, that's the wall. Uh, so we are uh, operating under the assumption that that giant stretch of ice is the wall, um, which means we're going back to the wall for House of the Dragon season two. Uh, and yeah, thank you, Unbox PhD, which is the the scooper who is risking life and limb and legal action to <laughs> to bring all of us fans these great behind the scenes images. Uh, and yeah, so Dan, the question in my mind is, how do you feel about knowing the wall's coming back? Because I, I can't really remember how much the wall is talked about in Fire and Blood, mm -hmm. um, but it, I'm excited to see it. How, how are you feeling about this? I'm feeling curious because the answer to your question, how much is the wall talked about in Fire and Blood is a zero or rather... Um during the stretch of the book where the dance of the dragons happened which is the part that we're adapting the wall they mm -hmm. don't go to the wall at all so nobody goes to the wall in yeah. the book we doesn't go to the wall they don't go to the wall uh so they're adding in the wall they want to see the wall that's cool that, but th this means that they are adding this in like they do not go to the wall in this stretch of the book uh i can imagine a scenario where they do so at the end of the first season Rhaenyra targaryen told her son Jaceris Valerian, Jace to his friends, uh, to go up to Winterfell, win the allegiance of um, Lord Cregan Stark, which, minor spoiler alert, he does. They become bros, they become buddies. So I can picture a scene they add in where the two of them go to the wall, because why not? When you're in the north, you might as well stop by. You have a dragon, it's easy to get up there. But they're adding it. I'm betting they're like, I mean, we're up in the north. We don't really go north again for the entire story. Let's give the viewers mm -hmm. what they want and have two characters have a conversation on top of the wall. It'll be like old times. It's not in the books, but it doesn't seem like a big departure from the books either. Yeah, um, I think it's it makes total sense to me that House of the Dragon ooh. season two might want to include like a couple of scenes at the wall. Uh, because like you said, Jace is going to be up in Winterfell anyway. And it's kind of like, if they were going to do it, if they were going to show the wall at all in this show, this is the time to do it. Uh, you know, I'm pretty sure that was like Tyrion's logic too, back in Game of Thrones. Like I'm already in Winterfell. I might as well go see one of the wonders of the world. Um, so yeah, I, I'm actually pretty excited about that. I think that's a cool call and I'm really curious, uh, to see what they do with it. Uh, but that is not the only shot that we've gotten from the set of House of the Dragon. 
Uh, what's this next picture, Dan? Uh, it looks like something pretty intriguing. I I agree. Again, from Unbox PhD, we have a picture of a ship set. It's a Valerian ship. There are other pictures that have the Valerian seahorse flag on it. So, you know, those Trixie Valerian sailing all over the sea. It makes sense that have a ship. Uh, there's also another photo where there's some dried blood on the deck. Um, so basically boat. Boats mm-hmm. are everywhere. People take boats. People drive. People ride boats. People go on uh, water, seas, oceans, all that good stuff. There are some pretty big naval things coming up. Um, there's the Battle of the Gullet. That involves mm-hmm. boats. I think Rhaenyra sends away her two youngest kids on a boat to go ride out the war somewhere else. This could be that scene. Yep. Uh, I'm pretty sure that one of Damon's daughters g- travels by boat to the Erie to just hang out during the war. It could be that scene. Not surprised they'll be boats. Also, um, see, someone yeah. had a really good comment. It was uh, Nicole wondered if the wall set could have been for uh, Snow, the Jon Snow show, rather than for House of the Dragon. Uh, I very much doubt it, but intriguing. Very much so. When they are making snow, we'll know it. Um, We'll we'll broadcast that all over the place. Uh, But hey, maybe they'll build this and have it left over. Why not keep it? Always need a good wall. But yeah, it's a ship. Not much to really say there. It's a boat. Tad's Dragon Season 2 will feature boats. And finally, we yeah. have a pretty cool shot. And this, by the way, is the one where I'm impressed that Unbox PhD managed to get it without like being having it having their drone like blasted out of the air or something. Where it's an overhead shot of actors on what looks like the Red Keep set, including Ewan Mitchell as the one-eyed, trigger happy, very angry Aemon to Targaryen, seen from above. Uh, in kind of a blurry way, but just, you know, use your imagination uh, with his signature silver white Targaryen hair walking around. He's just kind of doing stuff. He's not really doing much. Daniel, I guess my question here is, how did no one notice that? There's like a drone above them taking pictures. How did no one look up and be like, someone do something about that? I mean, I assume they noticed it and uh, maybe got mad about it, but didn't have appropriate dragon fire or scorpion on hand to shoot it out of the air uh i i am surprised because this is the kind of thing where during game of thrones they probably would have been on top of shooting drones down over the set so it does seem like the security is maybe a tiny bit laxier laxer for house of the dragon right now which is okay you know they don't need to be shooting drones down out of the sky it's, this stuff isn't really that much at this point it, it's different than thrones where you know, they were going through stuff that hadn't been in the books yet. They were trying to keep Jon Snow coming back to life, a secret and blah, 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 all those sorts of things. Oh, true. Um, but yeah, I, I am impressed that that Unbox PhD managed to get their drone into all of these situations. And it's cool to see you and Mitchell uh, back in costume as Aemon, even if it's, uh, you know, a dragon's eye view of Aemon. Uh, I'm excited to see what he gets up to next season because yeah, cool. should have a good one. Um, we also found out some other interesting stuff too, right? Uh, so the directors were allegedly revealed for season two. Is that right? Yeah, um, allegedly. I'm going to go ahead and assume this is correct because it was running intelligence. They're very, very good. Uh, they had the director lined up and some ah, great yeah. comments, by the way, we'll, we'll get to in just a second. Um Eight episodes. I'm just going to say eight names for each episode uh, quickly, and um, <laughs> we'll just run it down, and then and then you'll know. <clears throat> episode one, Alan Taylor, who directed uh, Ned Stark's Petting back in Game of Thrones. I lied already. I'm so off. Uh, episode two, Claire Kilner, who directed uh, King of the Three episodes of House of Season One. Uh, episode three, Gita Patel, who directed Lord of the, the Lord of the Tides, the best episode of House of Dragons season one. I love that one. That was great. That's one where Sarah walks in all uh, 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 haggard and falling apart to the Iron Throne, and I cried my eyes out it's like three, four times. Uh, episode four, Alan Taylor, uh, the Game of Thrones director, also directed Thor: The Dark World. I don't know if he wants to brag about that, but he did. Uh, episode five, Claire Kilner again coming back. Episode six, <laughs> Andridge uh, Parekh, who directed a lot of Succession episodes. Succession's an amazing show, so great to have him on board. 
Um, mm. Episode seven, Lonnie Perestier, who directed Warrior, which is the most, the best show, the most underrated show on TV right now. I'm glad she's, she also directed The Witcher. Um, you know, take it as you will. Mm. And finally, episode eight, Gita Patel, who uh, directed the best episode of House of the Dragon season one. So great. She's handling the finale. Good all over. Uh, Daniel, any uh, reactions to any of those? Or are you like, wow, uh, numbers and names, cool. <laughs> uh, no, I definitely have thoughts. Uh, my first thought is, wow, you read those so fast. That was incredible. Uh, but I also, so a few things from this. It's cool to see Gita Patel uh, have two episode credits in season two. So episode three and the finale, potentially. Uh, like you mentioned, uh, Gita Patel did The Lord of the Tides, which I think we can pretty safely say was like the best episode of season one. Oh, I, I think yeah. it's been pretty in, undisputably held up as the best episode because of the Viserys. Um, so not surprised to see Gita Patel get basically what amounts to like a promotion for season two. They're they're giving her the finale. Um it's to see so Alan Taylor uh made big headlines because when Miguel Sapochnik was announced to be leaving, we shortly thereafter got information that Alan Taylor would be joining the show. Mm -hmm. Like you mentioned, he did Ned Stark's beheading, I believe. So yes. a crucial Game of Thrones director coming back to Westeros. And he's doing the premiere and also episode four, which makes me wonder if episode four is going to be a set piece episode like Rook's Rest. Um, you know, anytime you see like a, a director who's done one of the big set piece episodes get uh, directing credit, I always wonder like what's going to happen in that episode. Like with Sapochnik, you can usually do that when he was on these oh, shows. Sure. Like if it's a Sapochnik episode stuff's probably going to go down then. I kind of feel that way about Alan Taylor in House of the Dragon this year. Um, uh, so I don't know what's going to go down in episode four. Um, Lonnie Peristere, I was not super familiar with, but I believe did The Art of Illusion, which is the Thanad Ball episode of Witcher. So it's episode five of the newest season. Um, yeah, it is. Wondering if there's going to be some politicking going on in episodes six and seven, because we've got a succession director and a Witcher director who did basically, you know, the murder mystery party of the Witcher. It's all talking that episode. So, yeah, a lot of interesting stuff just based on the directors. And then, of course, Claire Kilner, um, who. Oh, Workhorse. OK, OK. Can I. Can I throw a theory out there? And then I want to see what you think of this theory. Hit it. So bear with me. Claire Kilner directed um, episode nine of House of the Dragon season one, which is yeah, the did. episode where the Greens do their coup over King's Landing, the bottle uh -huh. episode. It, the most divisive episode of the season by quite a lot. Um, if episode four... And this is spoilers for people who haven't read Fire and Blood. If episode four is Rook's Rest, we have seen shots come out of the set of a particular dragon head being paraded through King's Landing. And I wonder if they're going to give Claire Kilner another King's Landing episode since she did a specialized King's Landing episode with the Greens in season one. Are they also going to give her the Greens triumphant return from Rook's Rest as episode five? What do you, what do you think of that, Dan? I think it could happen, Daniel. Fair. Also, really a little nitpick, a uh, a bottle episode. Um, that yes. ep that was not a bottle episode. A bottle episode is like in one room. You can't have a bottle episode when you have like 18 rooms in the Red Keep, scenes in the streets, and a giant set piece where a dragon bursts through the floor of a royal coronation. It's not a bottle episode. Um, I don't know why I feel strongly about that. Uh, that's a good lineup. That's the bottle. Also. Okay. Uh, also, <laughs> uh, Lonnie Perestier, she did the Witcher one at the Fenigan Ball, so she's responsible for um, All Is Not As It Seems, which I'm just going to note that right here. And, uh, well, yeah, it looks like a good lineup. Looking forward to it. And there are some good comments we're getting. Let's see here. Uh, as uh, Targaryen Loyalist said, the ship is probably the Sea Snake ship, Lord Corthus's ship, probably right. 
Uh, he likes to travel in style. Um, ooh, and he also they also theorized that maybe they let out the drone image on purpose so we would have something to look at us being the fans because it's taking so much longer to come out maybe they don't seem to like doing that thing studios very much but it's nice to think there would be that magnanimous i prefer to think he just somehow got like a stealth drone in there and was able to dangle <laughs> it over with nobody noticing um and that's about all she wrote for yeah. westeros gonna be exciting gonna be juicy gonna be fun gonna be uh disco um, and Nicole says, I hope we're talking about the Witcher today because that finale was, and then a smiling poop emoji, Daniel, let's talk about the Witcher, the final three episodes uh, uh, of the Witcher dropped uh, on Netflix over the weekend. Uh, you watched them all full disclosure. I've watched the first two of the yeah. final three. So I, I still, okay. I still haven't watched the finale, but Daniel, I'll turn it over to you because you have a bit of I feel like the narrative in general online has been that the episodes are pretty rough. The third season is pretty rough overall. Lots of think pieces about like they wasted Henry Cavill's final appearance with Geralt of Rivia, that kind of thing going on. Um, and you have another thought. What is that thought? Yeah, I think that's a total garbage take. So like, <laughs> Nicole, tell us why you think the finale was poop, because I want to talk about it. It's been so fascinating to me. So I have, I've seen The Witcher season three a couple of times through now. I also have rewatched season one and most of season two since it aired. Um, I've read all the books. I've played the games. So this is all very fresh in my mind. I think season three is far and away like objectively easily the best the show has ever been um Man. i and that goes to like the writing the production value the special effects like everything about this season is head and shoulders better than season two so to see people say like it's just continued Old. going downhill like that feels like a narrative catching on to me <gasps> more than like anyone like it's just not fat like sorry it's just not true like rewatch season two i beg you it has not gotten downhill since then um so i really liked the last three episodes and part of that is because they are extremely faithful to the book series um this is exactly how this part of the book series plays out with the thanad ball happening uh Geralt's loses very badly this is so spoiler alert here the single worst injury he gets in the entire saga and it's gonna bug him for the rest of his life he basically develops like arthritis from this <laughs> um so it, he's never going to be the same after thanad uh the siri bottle episode which can, I, so a bottle episode it one room like you said but fantasy right so that means it's King's Landing on House of the Dragon. That means it's just the desert. The desert is the bottle, Dan. Do you want to interject? You you look so pained. We're trying not to interject because there's a bit of a delay. But no, you're straight wrong. Even <laughs> if that was an episode, it's the desert. There are scenes in episode that aren't. There are scenes in episode <laughs> back in Finned. It's not just here in the desert. And if they mm -hmm. travel, to, if you travel to Morocco. True. And you and you Correct. you film flashbacks and visions of other places, and there are other places. It's not a bottle episode. Okay, please continue. I'm sorry. No, no, that's that's legit. So I am not attached to the bottle episode. Uh, you know, phrasing or whatever. We can toss that. <laughs> but it is Nicole a 37 it. minute sequence of just Siri. Sure. So Nicole hated it. And this is the fascinating thing to me because I'm hearing a lot of people be like, ah, I wish it was more faithful. They just focused on Siri for a whole episode. And then Geralt is laid out in bed basically for the back two episodes of the season. And like, that is the story. It, being mad yeah. about that is the equivalent of saying, I wish Ned Stark didn't die on Game of Thrones. Ooh. Like the final two chapters of the book this season is based on our Siri in the desert. You don't ever see Geralt again for like the last almost 100 pages of this of the book. So they actually gave uh, Henry Cavill and Geralt 
much more to do in the show than in the novel. They brought in some of the the following book, Baptism of Fire, so that he could end basically getting back on his feet and getting back on the path to go on this personal war against Nilfgaard to free Ciri because he thinks Ciri is with Emir, even though she's not. Um, so yeah, it, it is fascinating because I, I've seen so many people talk about, about how it's a waste of Cavill, it is boring, this and that. Um, it's so much worse than season two. And it's like, this is the most faithful this show has ever been. These final three episodes, like the Thanad coup goes down differently, but the big events of the coup are still more or less the same. Um, and and like, this is just what the story is. So it, I almost feel like the Witcher tied itself in knots to try to appeal to non-book readers before this. <sighs> And now that they've gone back to essentially what is the book story, a lot of people are just not having it. And it's interesting to me because it just it is objectively better this season. And again, you can rewatch rewatch season two if you don't believe me. Like the production value of this show is vastly improved. Um, Dan, what did you think of this season? Because you so you have read the book. You have seen most of the season. Mm-hmm. Um, did you think it was worse? What are your thoughts? I will give you my thoughts. And once I am done giving you my thoughts, you will know my opinion. But first, Robert Harris uh, asks, and you cool. can answer this because you watched the last episode. Um, does Tessiah die in the same manner in the book story? I didn't watch the finale yet, so I'm not sure. Yes, Tessiah dies in almost yeah. exactly the same manner. Um, right down to, uh, so spoiler alert, slitting her wrists, uh, to trigger warning, to say it commits suicide in the finale. Um, and Dan, sorry, you already know this, so I'm not sorry. Um, oh, no. But yeah, sorry. it happens almost exactly the same. The The show added a romance between her and Vilgefortz, mm-hmm. and a lot of people have taken that as they made her suicide about the romance. But it's not. And the actor has talked about that it is not just about the romance. It is all these different ways that Tessaia feels responsible for Thanid um, and for essentially her life's work and all of her friends crumbling down and dying around her. So yes, to Tessaia's ending, I will say, the show actually explored more, but the the scene itself of to say a committing suicide is very similar, except Yennefer is more relevant to it. So Yennefer is not relevant to to say as suicide in the book. Um, so they made it a, a beefier scene with a lot more emotional resonance than it is in the book, but it it's still exactly the same, more or less. Uh, okay, Dan. Now, now let's talk about your thoughts. Gotcha. Well, uh, Robert thought that it was it was a shocker to him as a non-book reader. I was kind of laughing there because I, 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 yeah. I don't know, because he asked, like, does she die in the same way? And I thought, OK, so that's a good way that we can say, like, yes or no without having to spoil it exactly. And, and then you just went, like, yeah, she had the same way. She and here's My how bad. it happened. Oh, no, no, no. It was perfectly fine. It was just, it was just a little funny moment yeah. for me. OK, so I'm going to start by quoting something that Nicole said a while back. <clears throat> it was so confusing and convoluted. It seems like they made the show for book watchers and game players without explaining anything to the TV watchers. I have no idea which faction is against which and why. And I'm assuming you're referring there, Nicole, to um, the coup episode where everybody is running around uh, Thanid, Eratuza, whatever we call it, and fighting each other for control to get Siri for all kinds of reasons. And OK, so speaking of someone, I yeah. did read this book before watching this, Nicole, Daniel. I still didn't know what people wanted and why. And I've read the book. Um, I agree. I do think it was, it, I had, I enjoyed yeah. watching it. It was fun, but yeah, it was kind of confused. And I do agree with you, Daniel. Yes. Yeah, so I've watched all three seasons. I've read not the entire series, but um, every book that has been adapted so far. And this season is more accurate than the first two seasons. Book accurate. That's true. Anyone who says like, uh, they're they're abandoned clusters like yeah and they have been since the start and this is actually a correction for them like they were abusing it harder earlier that is true yeah. i guess what I, the conclusion i've come to 
um, after having read some books and watching the show. I don't think the books are that great. And I don't think the show is that great either. I, I thought it was lame in the first season. I thought it got worse in the second season. I think the third season is the best. I think it's the best they've done so far. And it's still just, I don't like it very much. I think it's, I think it's fun in like a goofy Hercules legendary journey sort of way. And I do like, I can like that. I enjoy that kind of stuff. And occasionally it'll like kind of reach for some more resonance. It it wants to be sometimes a more Game of Thronesy serious thing, but it's just it's just not tight enough to sell itself that way to me. Like they're just all of these, and I've said a lot of them yeah. to you here before. We're just these goofy ass moments. Like the most recent one, I watched the desert episode. And like <laughs> Yaskier, like tells Radovid, like go to this town. I have a safe house. Ask for me. And I'm like, you have to say where it is. Like <laughs> she did just walk into like Cincinnati and mention like, do you know where Yaskier's safe house is? Like what? Does, what? What? What are you talking about? <laughs> um, and there's just there's just stuff like that constantly, and it's kind of fun because it's campy and it's fun to watch. I don't dislike watching the show. But I don't think it succeeds as like a serious work of like compelling fantasy fiction. I agreed with um with Nicole. I did not know who was wanting what exactly. I mean, I could I could I could piece it together more or less. I also because I read the book, but it was still sort of a blur, and I I didn't care that much. I'm shocked at how much of this series with the books and the show has gone in one ear and out the other for me. Like, I haven't retained a lot. And both you and my partner are big fans of it. And both of you played the games first. Maybe that's the key. Maybe that's where folk get attached to this. Yes. And and start to love it. Because I have not touched the games. I just read the books and watched the show. And to be honest, I really haven't liked either of any of it. Um, so, but this is the best season so far. I agree with that. I, I liked Vilgefort's kicking the crap out of Geralt. I remember that. I liked Josiah bringing down Thunder. That was fun. I appreciated the desert episode. I, I thought it was well done. I like Siri. I like Freya Allen. I think she's good. <sighs> the monsters look great, but the show in general, <laughs> my opinion, I don't think it's that good. I don't think it ever was. And I feel like people, I don't know, overpraised it in the first season over hated it in the second season and now they're on kind of a hate hangover about it but i i think it's fine people work very hard on it i'm glad for them good for them i'm glad a folk like it i just don't think this season this series is particularly for me after having gotten pretty deep in although i'm gonna keep watching and reading because i i want to see it through now yeah um I think that's really fair, honestly. And and I have thought about this because you've said this before mm -hmm. and I have heard this from other people before, like didn't particularly particularly like the books or the show in one ear and out the other. Most forgettable fantasy book series. I've heard people say stuff like that about The Witcher. Yeah. So that is not shocking to hear. I think, so I'm going to put out a theory here. Mm -hmm. I think there are two types of Game of Thrones fans. I think you and I represent them. And I think that Ooh. spills over to how we like things like The Witcher. Mm -hmm. There are Game of Thrones fans who think Lady Stoneheart was a stupid zombie that serves no purpose. And there are Game of Thrones fans who think Lady Stoneheart is one of the coolest parts of the series. You are the type who thinks she was stupid. I am the type who thought she was awesome. And I think the type who, are, who thought Stoneheart was awesome are more into the creature's type of fantasy the 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 sure. mad like the campy fantasy like you said versus the game of thrones fans who thought she was stupid who it's like the appeal there is that game of thrones is like fantasy but also real life um yeah. in terms of how it's navigated so the witcher is clearly fantastical fantasy i don't blame you at all for maybe having a harder time getting into it um i do think what you said about the games is fair though as well that your partner played the games i played the games awesome. Awesome. The, in my opinion the witcher 3 is the single best witcher anything 
that mm-hmm. has been made. The Witcher 3 Wild Hunt, that game. It is better than the books. And like, don't tell Anders Edge Sapkowski I said that so he doesn't get mad at me. <laughs> but it, like, that is the masterpiece of The Witcher, in my opinion, at, at the moment. So there's truth to that. Um, but so before I answer Nicole, do you have, do you want to respond to that at all? That wasn't your answer to Nicole. Um, uh, no, I, I think, I think it's good. I, I, I like the, uh, the breakdown of there's two types of blank. I always love there's two types of blank, um, kind of arguments. Yeah. Um, I'll keep watching. We have some good comments. We got, um, Leo says, damn dance. How do you feel? I mentioned when Liam Hemsworth comes in, honestly, I mean, I know that Leo said the H is a downgrade, unacceptable. Eh, bring him on. Um, it could be a change. I did really like Henry Cavill as Geralt. I did think he did a good job. Um, even in season yeah. three, I still, I think there are a lot of talented folk. I still thought he was sort of, whenever he had a lot of talent, he just had a gravitas that not everyone on the show has. I do think he's very good. But I'll try them out. I'm not prejudiced. Bring on one of the Hemsworth brothers. Hemsworth number two. It could be you could do worse. At least it's not the third one, whose name is um. Eh, it'll come to me. Who cares? Yeah. Uh, and Andrew says Dan's like I already committed all this. Might as well see it through. <laughs> yeah, why not? They're not like long books. I can read it. It's not gonna be that hard. Um, and yeah. Daniel, did you want to respond to Nicole? Do you have a response can in that up, up in there? Yeah, yeah. So about Thoned being confusing, I, this is another thing I think is fascinating from an adaptation perspective. So the producers of the show talked about this fairly recently. They actually s- simplified Thoned exponentially for the TV series because in in the book it is like this nuts. complex political summit on on the island. And it is hard to keep track of. Like, I totally agree with Dan, with Nicole. I agree with both of you to the degree that when I watched this uh, with my partner, she was like, I don't know what's going on, but I'm enjoying it. And the very oh, first thing I thought to write me. about The Witcher's these final three episodes was explaining who the factions were in the Thonid Ball or in the coup. So actually, if you are confused, there is an article about this on winteriscoming.net. Um, but yeah, so they simplified it for Western audiences because they thought that it was too confusing to just convey the politics of it the way it is in the book. So I don't dispute that it's still confusing. Like it is totally. Uh, but it's interesting to see that they made a very conscious effort to cater to non book fans by simplifying the Thoned coup. So when people come back and say it's too confusing, that's an interesting thing to me because they simplified an already complex thing and people are saying, well, it's still too complex. And they really couldn't make it any simpler without just really trashing it, in my opinion. Um, not to say there weren't things they could have made clearer. They definitely could have. Uh, but yeah, it's the push and pull of of the adaptation aspect of The Witcher in this season especially, I just think is so fascinating because they're kind of torn between three different groups of fans so the game fans the book sure. fans who may be familiar with other things and the people who haven't read the book or played the game who are just show watchers and accommodating to all three of those fan bases is challenging and i think this yeah. season we're yeah, especially seeing that um i have two quick things to say before i move on a <laughs> my problem with fitted mm-hmm. wasn't that it was too complex or simple i just they didn't if they tried to simplify it, I think they did a bad job. <laughs> like, I think if they did a good job, I would understand it. And so would folk. Um, the, the second thing is, I do sympathize with that. Yeah, they had a lot of um, kind of uh, masters to serve. And I predicted back in season one, when the showrunner Lauren Hiss was on Twitter, like interacting with fans who at that point were rapturously in praise of the thing. I, I, I said, girl, get out. You're in danger. This is not going to last. Yeah. If you stay on Twitter, this will turn, like justifiably or not. <laughs> do not like yeah. put stock in what folk are saying on Twitter because it's very fickle and they will turn on you. And they did. Um, I'm not sure if she's still on Twitter, but just I want to note yeah. that I was the Cassandra of Twitter backlash in that case. Um, moving on. From The Witcher, perhaps we'll <laughs> talk about uh, more updates, talk about the rats as it comes by. 
and folk here seem to to have watched it. Robert Harris yeah. thought the Geralt fight was badass, which I agree with. Um, and I mean, I don't agree with the critiques of like, oh, Geralt should have won. I'm like, I don't know, Vilgefortz. Like, how is Vilgefortz that much stronger than him? I don't know. He is. Like, that's what his character is. He's been around for like eight hundred years or whatever, and he's really, yeah. really powerful. So work, work, Vilgefortz. You get yours. Um, Daniel, you watching anything else? nowadays and anyone out there watching us are you watching anything what do you think of it and what do you tell us my answer is no i am not watching mm-hmm. anything oh, else for the last week i have been so deep in the witcher immersion that <laughs> i've hardly like watched it. anything like like i said i've rewatched season three and most of the first two seasons so uh, I've also been playing the third game. I've been skimming the Damn. books as I've been writing about this for the site. So I have been just on all sides immersed in The Witcher for the past week. I'm even, yeah. The only other thing I've watched a little bit of that I really liked uh, is The Bear, actually, because my partner's oh, been watching The, the Bear. Bear. So I, I finally have seen some of it. And that's been great. It's given me a little bit of anxiety, but uh, it's good anxiety. Uh, how about you, Dan? What what have you been watching this week? I'll tell you, but um, we haven't watched the Bear season two. Is it giving you anxiety because you like fear health inspections or something, or like what? <laughs> no, because I've worked in the restaurant industry, oh, and and the Bear gotcha. really nails that part of the show uh, of the stress of people having breakdowns in the kitchen when stuff goes wrong. Oh. It is so on point uh i haven't seen season two yet we just finished season one and watched i think the premiere of season two so it, it, it's just the way it's portrayed there are a lot of really good oneers one shots in the bear too i noticed like in the kitchen <laughs> where it's just like that. one shot going from all the different people at their stations and then people walking off camera and coming back on in the in the foreground or the background so yeah, it's just the the filmmaking and the writing are so good that it makes me anxious. Uh, but that's yeah, that's no that's no that's health that's inspection that's PTSD that's here. Uh, as Leo, yes, sure. as uh, yeah, Leo, as Christian says, very professional folk PTSD. I worked at the 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 snack shack at the Hinsdale Golf Club for for a summer. That's my that's my restaurant experience. I, I didn't like do it a ton. Um, I'm, and Nicole's yeah. watching the congressional UAP hearing, having immersed in that. If that can, it totally does. I didn't watch nearly enough, Nicole, uh-huh. about uh, the. I will say I kind of lightly object to calling them UAPs. I mean, we've been saying UFOs for so many years, or um, uh, uh, you know, space discs. But aliens are among us. Like, turn to your left, turn to your right. One of those people yeah. is extraterrestrial. But um, I didn't watch much of that, but I am interested. I've been watching Good Omens on Amazon, which is, you know, just as charming as it was. Again, it's that uh, Good Omens is uh, the Neil Gaiman show about uh, David Tennant, Michael Sheen, Angel and Demon living on Earth in like a platonic life partnership. Very cute, very British, like very just British, dry as a bone, deadpan humor, which is nice and kind of like um, whimsical. I'm enjoying it. It's not like the meatiest thing in the world, but it's fun. Uh, Warrior, I'll stump again. Amazing show. And now that we're getting toward the end of the third season, it's really ramping up. The show's a great job of building. Um, they just had a bit of a red wedding thing last episode. I really enjoyed that. Costumes are great. Characters are great. It looks tremendous. The fight choreography is amazing. Uh, the storylines are very carefully crafted, even if they can be kind of melodramatic at times. And they're really, they're getting to a crescendo so that's one to watch. Again, just all the time. If you haven't watched Warrior, please check out Warrior on Max. It's so good. Oh, Andrew says, could the uh, UAPs be scrolls? Um, you know what? I'm going to go ahead and say a good 60% chance. Uh, he's also watching Rebels, which you have watched, Daniel. You are familiar with the Star Wars Rebels. You and Andrew mm-hmm. both. Yes. Uh, Robert Harris watching Hijack on Apple TV. That's Idris Elba one. I heard about it, but I don't really know what it is. And the last thing I watched really fast, like no one watches this but me, but um, I'm a big fan of the Venture Brothers, like that old adult swim cartoon from like the early 2000s. Yeah, they yeah. just released the Venture Brothers movie. It's the end of the series. I always loved that show. Huge heart, just really walked to the beat of its own drum, even though that drum was just very strange and like 
the, the opposite, like mass appeal. Uh, very niche, but I yeah. really loved it. I thought it was great. I thought the series was great. Um, I'm just uh, kudos to that show for sticking it out for like 20 some years and making a season every three years when they would pony up the cash for it. Um, wonderful show, but mainly yeah. watch Warrior. Warrior is so good. Cool. I, you it? know what? Neither of us has watched. And uh, Dan, you've got an eye on the chat. So if anyone out there is watching this, tell us. Uh, Futurama oh, is back on good. right now, right? So that's something Nick- I, hmm. I feel like has come back. And I haven't really seen a lot of people <laughs> talking about it. Do, do you think you're going to watch the new Futurama? Um, if I had time, that's definitely a thing where like, am I folding laundry? Do I have something to watch? Am I like answering uh, endless <laughs> emails, washing dishes? I'll put on Futurama. Sure. I don't see why not. I also watched the Adam Eve thing on Amazon, Robert Harris. That was great. Um, that show is, uh, that's like an invincible one-off, uh, Daniel, uh, the Adam Eve special. That's just come back later this year. Really, really good show. I, I, I like Invincible quite a bit. Um, and Andrew has a great question. Uh, what's the worst rebranding? Uh, HBO Max to Max or Twitter to X? I think it's obviously Twitter to X. At least HBO Max still has Max obviously. in the title. Twitter to X. It's like he wants to be a. Who names their company X? It's 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 definitely so, like super villain vibes. Yeah, I I read a a a deep dive on this and how that's been an obsession of his for years. Yeah. Apparently, so he was instrumental in the founding of PayPal. There was a time he tried to rebrand PayPal as X, and the board of essentially like voted him out <laughs> after this. Uh, after he tried to push that through, so yeah, it that's so it's so dumb. Um, I loathe it. Uh, yeah, the theme of of life right now apparently in media is uh billionaires getting companies and doing awful rebrands because i think both of those rebrands are stupid uh but yeah x is the worst one for sure i mean just imagine you have twitter like the word tweet managed to force its way into the english lexicon it wasn't a word before like it became a word yep. even if you don't use twitter you know what a tweet is because there are those like four years from donald mm-hmm. trump was in policy over twitter and like everyone like everyone was supporting like donald trump tweeted this 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 is this like you know what it is you made a new yeah. word you basically own that word that's branding money in the bank and you change it it's just posts now it's just make posts to twitter you got rid of the like distinctive word that was basically yours to own you put it on like shirts, anything, and you replaced it with posts. I'm not in marketing, but that seems silly to me. (laughs) Yeah. Yep. We cannot parse the logic, but I don't see any lot. Maybe that's because there is no logic to be parsed. Um, Yeah. It's like Zex. It's it's bad. It's a fun letter. It looks like this. It's it's nice. Yeah. Unless we're talking about Mega Man X. It's dumb. Oh, that's the good only ass game. Rebrand of that nature I approve of. Okay, uh, um, two, two quick one, com- So you had one other note here. Yeah, no, comment away. Uh, just quickly, um, someone asked me if I would finish with the Orville. Not yet. I'm watching a lot of stuff, but don't worry. It's always in the it's always on the back burner. The Orville is great because, like, whenever I find myself with an hour to watch a TV show, I'm like, you know what? I can depend on that to be good. So, um. I will finish yeah. that sooner or late. And then, oh, uh, Martha says this, uh, this week is last episode of Outlander and last week episode was a cliffhanger. Martha actually, yeah, uh, as Nicole says, no Outlander this Friday. They're skipping a week. I don't really know why, but um, there is no Outlander this Friday. They're going to show the mid-season finale next Friday. It's not a holiday or anything. I have no idea. Why, whatever. Um, anyway, Daniel, you were going to say, and no, Andrew, I haven't, I still haven't seen it. I know this Superman show. Um, I'm very busy. We're looking for a house. We have an infection. We had to get our dog, uh, uh, shots. Um, so it's not my fault. It's everybody else's Daniel. Go ahead. Yeah, that's exciting. Um, Mm -hmm. yeah. Outlander, you know, they, they've always kind of done weird things with skipping weeks periodically throughout the show's run. So, I don't know why they're skipping a week, but I'm also like, that's not that surprising. Uh, that'll be fine. And this is sure. the mid-season finale. 
So we still will have eight more episodes, I believe, Mm -hmm. coming next year, sometime in 2024, I think. Um, which is really nice because so many other shows are going to get delayed because of the strikes, but it seems like Outlander will not because they already filmed the rest of season seven, I believe. Um, we'll see. But yeah, so the the other thing uh, that you had noted here that <laughs> I'm so, I'm curious how you are feeling about this and all of you out there, I'm curious how you are feeling about this. So Loki Hmm. season two dropped its first trailer. It got a premiere date. It is coming October 6th and it just wreaked so much of damage control to me (laughs) that they released it like the week of secret invasions finale when everyone is complaining about how bad secret invasion was to, to be like, well, this good show is coming back. Um, I'm nervous for Loki after the, the MCU's recent kind of missteps. How are you feeling, Dan? Are, did you like um, season one? Are you excited for yeah. season two? I enjoyed season one. I'm really, I, I'm, I'm really not nervous because the trailer I thought looked pretty good actually. Uh, for Loki season two, it's also yeah. been very popular. It's, uh, broken some records in the view count for the amount of time it's been up on the air. Um, I, I also disagree that it, it was damage control because I think that's pretty standard practice for Marvel okay. and st- like the one show ends and like. When we have another one, like keep you mainlined, keep you putting in the drug into your system, and never let it, and never let you get off it, uh, to just keep you on going. It's cert- but it certainly helped that it it, it looked good, okay. and Secret Invasion was um a piddling pile of very little. Um, I'll probably yeah. watch it. I think it looks kind of interesting, and you know, it, it's it's nice to just have second seasons of stuff. Like Loki was popular to start and now it's more popular second season the wheel of time was like um kind of razzed a bit in the first season and then the trailer like blew past all the numbers for the first season it's good to get into a groove um and loki had a good first season looking forward to the second season i'm not that worried i guess i'm pretty forgiving as long as you as long as you entertain me you're fine in my book yeah very easy I think that's pretty fair. Um, And uh, yeah, I agree with that. Sometimes it takes shows time to find their footing. That's kind of how I feel about wheel of time. Like they had some Rocky bits in their first season. Uh, Wheel of time also got uh, screwed harder than most shows by the pandemic by quite a lot. uh, Cause they were like deep in production when it happened. Um, So I, yeah, I, it is nice to see shows coming back. I think, the Witcher is kind of a testament to just because a show has had well, bad seasons or rough patches, it can get better if you give it the time to. Um, but Loki was good in the first place. So I'm just nervous because the MCU has had some yeah. less good stuff in the recent past. So I'm like, all right, now it's now it's time to put up or shut up. Like Loki better not be bad because Loki was already a good show. Mm-hmm. Um so yeah, I I of course I'm gonna watch it. But I'm nervous. Ones. Cool. Well, yeah. um, we'll, we'll think about that as we go into the final segment of Take the Black, uh, the Wick News Lightning Round, where we go over stories we could have into the main body of the show and give our 20 second opinions. No more, no less. If we go over or under, we are disqualified. Go to jail. Indeed. All right. Uh, no order, yada, yada, yada. Not going to put them in any order, yada, yada, yada. Okay, I will go ahead and just ask you the first one, even though it's probably the most fun one. Uh, Daniel, George R. R. Martin saw the Barbie movie, and he wore this. Oh, Yes, beautiful. he did. I love it. Uh, you know, George R. R. Martin, he's a big cinema buff. He it's is. nice to see him going out and uh, getting into this cultural moment for the movies. I thought it was cute that uh he tweeted out i'm knuff uh (laughs) with this so yeah love it love it hope he hope he and paris had a great time well done um oh this is a fun one too so uh thomas jojen reed brody sangster uh he got engaged to (laughs) to lula ex mrs elon musk riley 
and it looks like this. What, yeah, what's basically, the deal? like, so Thomas Forty Sangster, who played Jojen Reed on uh, Game of Thrones, also in Star Wars, Maze Runner, got engaged to Tallulah Riley, who was married two times to Elon Musk, who was also on Westworld. Uh, just fun. Who would have thought that? Uh, Game of Thrones actor gets engaged to ex Mrs. Richest Person in the World. What a fun game of Mad Libs we just had right there. Um, good for them. Congrats. Many happy returns. All Enough right, to make Daniel. you wonder if X is, uh, X. you know, the X rebrand is going through the midlife crisis of my ex just got engaged to George and Reed. Oh, he's on like year 15 of that. Uh, okay, Daniel. Uh, Donald mm -hmm. Glover and his brother Stephen Glover, probably, uh, take over writing duties for the Lando Calrissian Disney Plus show. Yeah, uh, this is interesting because just like the week before, I think the person who was attached to the Lando show made headlines for saying they didn't know what was happening with it. Yeah, yeah. And this and, is what's uh, happening. I guess now we know. Yeah, I guess now we know why they didn't know because Donald Glover and, and his brother are taking over. I think that's great. Uh, Donald Glover was he did a good job as Lando. So I hope the show I'm curious to see what they do with the show work. Um. Ah, all right. Getting into some strike news. So Arrow star Stephen Amell does not support striking. He thinks it is a reductive negotiating tactic and finds the entire thing incredibly frustrating. That said, he said, I support my union. I do. And I stand with them. Presumably just not in striking. Uh, he later mm. walked back those comments a bit, but it's ruffled a lot of feathers. What are your thoughts? I mean, it has. I, I'm going to try and be generous. He was talking at like a comic con, maybe speaking at a turn. I mean, it is, it is kind of attention, right? Like I don't support striking, but I support my union, which is striking. I mean, if you don't support your union, or it's a strike. I don't see how you can not support strikes. And it's just, he seems put out that he can't promote his show basically. And he's, he's, he's being a little whiny in public. Um, You know, there are worse crimes. <laughs> it's fine. Um, yeah. Speaking, can speaking I... of the, I, I suppose if you must go over I 20 just seconds want to toss to something out there i yeah i will gladly go to jail for the steven ml shade i saw another news interview he did today mm -hmm. that was these same sorts of comments so yeah. the walk back didn't stick he he was already out doing more interviews to say more of the same stuff but sorry let, let us continue yeah he he's he's not he's he's not really been a team player um, but speaking of the strike, maybe he'll be happy to know that uh, the <laughs> movie studios, like the, the the big ones who are who are the actors and writers are striking against, uh, want to talk to the Writers Guild of America on Friday to reopen negotiations. So that's a sign that at least the writers strike may be making progress, not the actors strike, though. Yeah. Um, I, you know, I hope that they are able to negotiate. This mm -hmm. is kind of one of those things where I'm, I'm hopeful, but at the same time, we really don't know until they talk because they could invite them back and just shoot down all their stuff again. Like we don't know what they're going <laughs> to propose as counters, which has been the whole thing. They didn't really propose any counters for a lot of stuff. They just said, nah. Um, so yeah, we'll be watching that closely. Um, oh, this is interesting this was, this was and cool. is giving me a feeling or two. Uh, all right, uh, Dan, what I'm so I'm so curious <laughs> to hear you talk about this. So a, there is sounds... a rumor that the Mandalorian season four oh. is going to get turned into a movie. Yeah, I've read this at all. Um, so I don't have a lot of context, but I know it's a thing. It's everywhere. Uh, turn into a movie. <sighs> I can, I, I'm going to say, I don't believe it. it. It doesn't really hold up for me. I can't believe that sounds like a bad idea to like have a TV audience and then just change the format and confuse everyone and make them go to a theater. when They don't need to and pay money when they're already paying for a description. Um, seems like a bad idea. I think it's probably just hot air is my guess and hope. Yeah. And I'm interested to hear about this. Uh, Daniel Warner bros. Japan mm. is offended over the official Barbie Twitter account, which I remind you is a Warner Bros. movie, um, engaging with the 
Barbenheimer meme that was going around a couple of weeks ago. Can you break this complex geopolitical issue down in 20 seconds? I can try. Uh, so Oppenheimer, a uh, movie about the man who invented the atomic bomb, two of which got dropped on Japan during World War II. Enormous okay. uh, cultural tragedy for Japan. Um, yeah, two arms of Warner Brothers basically going at it because the, the Barbie account retweeted, you know, just a, a meme about this. But the, it's not very sensitive to Japanese people. Um, so Warner Bros. Japan stepped up and said, hey, maybe don't do that. Yeah, I mean, like, you know, that's my very short breakdown. I can understand how people of Japan might not think it's very funny to make light little jokes about the atom bomb. Just having what's happened. Absolutely. Um, Absolutely. Right, and and I, we'll... I think it's fair. <laughs> yes. OK, hit me with the final one. OK, so Jack Leeson otherwise known as Joffrey Baratheon mm -hmm. from Game of Thrones, yeah, it is. is returning to the small screen as Wentworth in The Famous Five on the BBC. There he is. Keep him away from, I mean, anyone you know, really. He looks like he's uh, going to, I don't know, do unsavory things with your pets and children. Um, Jack Gleason, that famous villain, back in a TV show. Good for him. He looks creepy as all hell so he plays that role well interesting good for him yeah i was trying so hard to avoid unsavory jokes there but it's just what comes to mind look at that mustache uh anyway that was a great time thanks for watching everybody uh you know what we're here uh at these sites whether it be winter's coming youtube or winter's coming facebook every single wednesday at 2 p.m cst three on the east coast one on the mountains noon on the west coast and 3 a.m in beautiful kangaroo infested australia um come back check us out talk with us we'll have a good time we're also available in podcast form with uh anywhere podcasts are available be it itunes google play or elsewhere so join us because we have our eyes on the prize our heads in the game and our finger on the pulse of what's going down see you next week Bye.